Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames. My name is Alexandra Tsakhanovska. I'm the head of Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. And from this makeshift workplace with no heating like in so many Ukrainian towns and villages right now, we are doing our best to continue leading the discussions on the most vital and important topics regarding the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Today we talk about international organizations, uh, how effective or ineffective their actions are, what can be improved, and what are the consequences of their behavior for Ukraine, Europe, and the whole world. We begin with Dr. Katerina Busol, who does the impossible and explains the complicated legal matters in simple terms. So let's take a look at what's happening in the international courts, how things proceed, and uh, what may be the expected outcomes. Hello. My name is Katerina Busol. I'm a Ukrainian international lawyer and also a senior lecturer at the National University of the Kyiv Mohila Academy. Today we will discuss with you the justice avenues pursued by Ukraine to respond to Russia's military aggression against the country. It is important to stress that what we are witnessing now in many mass media, the reports from, of horrific alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity, is actually the continuation of the violations that have been there since 2014 and that have been unfortunately largely unnoticed by the international community because little action has been taken to uh, help and suspend those activities. Indeed, uh, despite the fact that so many human rights organizations, the report of the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine have been there since 2014, little action has been taken and as we will see only the current escalation has uh, catalyzed the international action. Second point, it is important to acknowledge that Ukraine has taken action both domestically and internationally to address the crimes perpetrated in the course of uh, the Russia-Ukraine armed conflict since 2014. The trainings of domestic investigators and prosecutors and judges, as well as the armed forces, have been conducted. The country has recognized that it indeed did largely lack the expertise of dealing with war crimes and crimes against humanity, which is understandable because uh, they have been in existence since uh, the World War II in the country. And of course, uh, parallel to that domestic effort, Ukraine launched a number of initiatives internationally um, at, as well as at the regional fora to try and adjudicate different aspects of Russia's conduct and get a legal pronouncement on them as well as hopefully reparations. Finally, the third point, it is important to acknowledge that Ukraine has been suffering from this aggression for a while and the efforts taken by the international community as well as the examination of the situation uh, in Ukraine by different international and regional courts now should take into account not only the violations which have been perpetrated since February 2022 but indeed all those perpetrated since 2014. And what is important further is to note the shared policy uh, of these violations and also to stop differentiating the uh, issues in Crimea and Donbass so harshly as it has unfortunately been done by some members of the international community because as the events of the recent weeks have shown, Russia indeed has the similar, in, the same intent and the same policy and was just instrumentalizing the Crimea and the Eastern Ukraine situation in the pursuance of its larger objective to deny the Ukrainian people its right to be a sovereign nation and pursue its destiny uh, as this nation wishes. Turning to Ukraine's adjudication efforts, Ukraine has uh, re resorted to different fora uh, to hold Russia accountable as a state, but also to hold Russia's top military and civilian officials accountable individually. As regards uh, the state responsibility, Ukraine submitted two cases before the International Court of Justice. The first one concerning the 
alleged racial discrimination in Crimea and the alleged financing of terrorism by Russia in eastern Ukraine. And the second case is very recent. It concerns the manipulation with the term of genocide under the Genocide Convention. And uh, as Ukraine alleges, the uh, unjustified and unlawful military action on the basis of alleged genocide in Ukraine. Just yesterday, on March 16th, the International Court of Justice adopted preliminary measures concerning the genocide case. The court uh, has expressly said that it realizes its responsibility to ensure international peace and security pursuant to its charter and to also ensure the peaceful settlement of disputes. The court said that unlike what Russia claimed in its written submissions, because Russia did not attend the hearings, uh, it did take this military action against Ukraine, not on the basis of the right to self-defense, as it tried to claim, uh, to claim before the United Nations Security Council, but indeed on uh, because also of many issues concerning the alleged genocide. The court, importantly, has investigated many public statements of Russia's top officials, including those of President Putin, uh, in, and concluded that Russia indeed for years has alleged the uh, mass atrocities in, of, and genocide in Ukraine. And the court concluded that that could not be justification of the military action. And as a preliminary measure, uh, before it concludes the consideration of this case, the court has asked Russia to suspend all military activities in the territory of Ukraine and also to suspend the military activities of other actors which might be under its command or support. Another dimension, the um, uh, accountability of particular individuals um, for the war crimes and crimes against humanity allegedly perpetrated in Ukraine uh, is being considered by the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Unfortunately, this court also needed the catalyst of this most recent harsh uh, wave of aggression by Russia to proceed with a proper investigation. As Ukraine recognized the jurisdiction of this court to consider the alleged war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide perpetrated in its territory since 2014, the court has actually opened an investigation only in February uh, this year, alleging um, that these crimes have been perpetrating, uh, perpetrated and also because uh, historically, more uh, 39 and then 40, two more countries referred the situation of Ukraine to the court, which catalyzed the investigation. Currently, the investigative group uh, of the court, as well as indeed its prosecutor, are in Ukraine, according to President, President Zelensky, and they are collecting evidence of the mass atrocities allegedly perpetrated in the country. They're interviewing the victims and witnesses and are building the cases. Ukraine continues its domestic effort to help these institutions in um, acquiring as much objective information as possible about the alleged crimes. Both the Office of the Prosecutor General as well as the, NG the consortium of the NGOs in Ukraine have set up special portals for submitting evidence uh, of alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, they're also issuing more and more instructions as to how better to document these alleged crimes. And of course, uh, they also continue developing the domestic capacity because Ukraine is still principally responsible or to investigate and prosecute the uh, atrocities committed by Russia in its own uh, Ukrainian territory. We're hoping to see more developments with international justice. Unfortunately, again, both the international community and, in a way, international and regional courts needed this harsh escalation to take the issue of uh, the Russia-Ukraine armed conflict more seriously. So we are hoping that this prize has not been in vain and further substantiated arrest warrants will follow both internationally and domestically. Our next speaker explores the topic of international cooperation in documenting war crimes and crimes against humanity a bit further. So please welcome human rights activist Oleksandr Matvichuk, who urges for boots on the ground uh, to make sure no crime goes unpunished because justice is important for all of us to maintain the balance in the world that right now seems so chaotic. 
My name is Alexandra Matvichuk. I'm Human Rights Defender, Head of Center for Civil Liberties. When the Russia started a new large-scale invasion February this year, we restore our initiative Yevromaidan SOS. One of the direction of our work is documenting war crimes. Russia used war crimes as a tool of conducting this war. That's why we documented a lot of cases of deliberate shellings on civilian objects like kindergarten, school, hospitals, uh, residential buildings. We documented attacks to medical personnel. Uh, we documented attacks to humanitarian corridors uh, and uh, to civilians, population as such. A lot of international organizations and international missions uh, do such kind of do documentation also, but distantly. We, as Yevromaidan SOS, together with uh, hundreds of other human rights and civil organizations, ask uh, international organization uh, to ensure international presence and international monitoring and do it uh, on the ground. We need their presence on hotspot and during such kind of evacuation. We ask them to return and to work together with us. Moving from war crimes and justice, we switch to a topic that is more interesting than it may initially seem, the synchronization of Ukraine and the European Union energy systems. Our speaker, Oksana Alieva, unveils the secrets behind this process, and she also offers some insights on what was the situation like in the earliest hours of the Russian invasion. Uh, she talks about the transition process uh, that took place under extraordinary circumstances, how it went, and what else needs to be be done. Hello everyone. My name is Oksana Aliva and I'm the Climate Change and Energy Policy Program Coordinator at the Cave Office of the Hundred Pot Foundation. I have been working in this area since 2011 and closely following energy sector decarbonization processes in Ukraine since 2015. The Ukrainian power system is working synchronized with the one of continental Europe starting from March 16, 2022. This is a very big advantage for Ukraine and stability of electricity supply in the war circumstances. In accordance to an initial plan, the synchronization should have happened in 2023 only as one of the stages towards European integration and independence of Ukraine from Russia. Ukraine and its transmission system operator, Ukrugnergo, have been preparing to this since 2016-2017. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian power system remained to be connected to the Russia and Belarus systems mostly. This connection made possible intergovernmental trade of electricity between these states and what is even more important, interstate flows of electricity. Interstate flows of electricity help to stabilize the power system operation. In simple language, when there is lack of electricity supply in the one country, interstate flows are applied to compensate it. As part of the euro integration process, the synchronization of the Ukrainian power system with the one of continental Europe was never welcomed by Russia and automatically by its fossil country, Republic of Belarus. Ukraine was diligent and in, in a, its attempts to gain more energy independence and surely preparing by increasing technical, operational, and financial readiness of the power grid and of transmission system operator Ukrainerga to become a member of the European network of transmission system operators for electricity. In the last stage of preparation before synchronization was to take place in 2022 when the Ukrainian power system was expected to be tested twice on a stability of operation in the isolated mode from Russian and Belarus power systems. The first test and cutoff from the Eastern networks was planned on February 24, 2022, and expected to last for three days. Ukraine disconnected its power system from Russia and Belarus and only in few hours after Russian missiles shelled Ukrainian cities and Russian troops have invaded territory of Ukraine 
what definitely could not be a coincidence. Managers of the Ukrainian energy sector took decision to do not reconnect to the Russian and Belarus networks, but appealed to the EU and the INSOE, European Network of Transmission System Operators for Electricity, for urgent synchronization. A reply from EU counterparts was immediate this time and very supportive. EU promised to do everything to make this possible. And in only three weeks, synchronization was successful. It is worth mentioning that this became possible due to the fact that even in worse circumstances, with many energy infrastructure objects in Ukraine being shelled and the biggest Zaporizhia nuclear plant occupied by Russian troops, Ukrainian power system demonstrated excellent stability of operation. The technical readiness from Ukrainian and from European side was already enough after six years of thorough step-by-step -step preparation since to the previous studies carried out and the adoption of risk mitigation measures. For three weeks, power system of Ukraine operated in isolated mode with connection only to the power network of Moldova. EU and Moldova shown themselves as reliable partners supporting Ukraine and its population in their fight for independence, including its energy aspect. All countries of the EU supported urgent synchronization after what has started. Continental Europe transmission system operators are now supporting the stability of Ukrainian, power, of Ukrainian Moldovan power system. This is crucial for Ukraine now to ensure stability of electricity supply within the country in war conditions and to avoid blackout if even more energy infrastructure objects are destroyed by the aggressor. Also, this will help overcome disproportions in an electricity demand and supply over the territory of Ukraine caused by shortage of demand and supply at the territories of hostilities at the east but increase in the demand at the west of Ukraine, reasoned by movement of population to more safe regions of Ukraine far from hostilities. Synchronization of Ukrainian power system with INSOE was also desirable and adapted even before war, because it can help demonopolize power sector by implementing European markets and its rules, including transparency. This applies also for reaching decarbonization goals, which cross cut the European energy markets. In so synchronization was necessary for further market reform of power system in Ukraine, and as well for better conditions for renewables and for balancing capacities to be employed in Ukraine. When all this applies, investors will be more willing to invest in Ukraine in Ukrainian energy sector after war, thus helping in energy and economic recovery. Ukraine will be not only potential recipient of investments and international aid, but if this recovery is well green designed, it can help to further energy stability and independence of European Union itself and reaching European Green Deal targets. Our another speaker has very deep personal knowledge of the issue of nuclear security that worries all of us deeply after the Russian attacks against two of Ukrainian nuclear power plants. Mr. Yuri Kostenko discusses the conduct of international organizations in this area and offers clear-cut advice on improving it. Yuri Kostenko, ex-minister of the Ukraine and the Ukraine, у 92-98 роках голова української делегації на переговорах із Росією щодо ядерного роззброєння, також голова державної делегації на переговорах із Великою Сімкою щодо закриття Чорнобильської атомної станції. Я хотів висловитися з приводу тих подій, які відбуваються на сьогоднішній день на ядерних об'єктах України. Як ви знаєте, Україна має п'ять діючих ядерних енергоблоків, які є ядерно небезпечними об'єктами. На превеликий жаль, з самих перших днів 
російської війни проти України. Позиція МАГАТЕ в першу чергу дивує не лише відсутністю фахових оцінок щодо подій на ядерних об'єктах України, але і виглядає зовсім безпорадною. З іншого боку, МАГАТЕ намагається переконувати, принаймні, фаховий світ у тому, що на ядерних об'єктах України, попри російську агресію, в цілому ситуація стабільна. Хочу категорично заперечити ці твердження МАГАТЕ, виходячи із власних оцінок того, що зараз відбувається на атомних станціях України і загалом в питаннях ядерної безпеки. Я очолював комісію Верховної Ради України в якості заступника, яка розглядала причини Чорнобильської атомної катастрофи. І саме наша комісія в 90-му році чітко визначила, що головною причиною того, що відбувся вибух на Чорнобильській АЕС, були не помилки ядерного персоналу, а конструктивні вади чорнобильських реакторів. Мене вразила поведінка тодішнього директора МАГТ пана Блікса, який по приїзді в Україну, зустрічаючись із нашою парламентською комісією, намагався проводити лінію, яку тоді відстоював Радянський Союз, що причина того, що відбулося в Чорнобилі, це не фахова, не фахові дії українських операторів. З тих пір в мене довіра до позиції МАГТ різко похитнулася. Сьогодні я можу сказати свою оцінку того, що не робить МАГТ, виходячи саме із цієї багатодітньої практики співпраці з МАГТ, тим більше, що я також очолював державну делегацію в МАГТ під час її генеральних асамблей. Отже, Мої висновки щодо того, що мало б робити МАГАТЕ у цій ситуації із захопленням українських атомних станцій та що вона не робить. Перше, після заяви Путіна про те, що однією із причин російської так званої спецоперації, тобто широкомасштабної війни проти України, є ядерна військова програма України яка буде загрожувати і Росії, і світу. Я не побачив жодних реакцій з боку МАГАТЕ на цю чергову російську провокацію. З іншого боку, ви повинні знати, що саме МАГАТЕ є органом, який здійснює контроль за нерозповсюдженням ядерної зброї. Що саме МАГАТЕ – після того, як Україна стала незалежною і поставила всю свою ядерну діяльність під МАГАТЕ, повністю знає все, що стосується ядерних матеріалів, які знаходяться на українських атомних станціях і в Чорнобильській атомній станції, в зруйнованому реакторі. Система моніторингу, яка користується МАГАТЕ, дозволяє їй повністю відповідати за кожен грам ядерного палива, як свіжого, так і відпрацьованого, які знаходяться на Україні. І саме МАГАТЕ повинна була в першу чергу спростувати цю тезу е Путіна щодо ядерної програми України. Вона цього не зробила. Друге. Коли війська дійшли до Чорнобильської атомної станції, а пізніше до Запорізької атомної станції, не було категоричної заяви МАГАТЕ із вимогою не наближатися з військовими діями за 30 кілометрів до цих ядерно-небезпечних об'єктів. Не було також адекватної оцінки того, які загрози несе з собою російська варварська армія на Чорнобильському майданчику, коли було відключено енергопостачання Чорнобильської атомної станції і була втрачена система моніторингу за тими ж самими ядерними матеріалами, але що страшніше за тим, скільки і які, в яких темпах накопичується водень у сховищах відпрацьованого ядерного палива, який загрожував на Чорнобильському майданчику повторенням Кештимської аварії, яка була в Радянському Союзі, радіаційна аварія перша масштабна, що знищила величезну кількість і людей, і забруднила величезну кількість 
територій радіоактивними відходами. Те ж саме стосувалося і з <кхем> Запорізькою атомною станцією, де МАГАТЕ не зробило аналогічні заяви, висновки із попередженням уже європейської спільноти і людства, що своїми діями Росія наближає світ до ядерної катастрофи. Масштаби невидані. Третє, що я хотів би сказати. Відсутня з боку МАГАТЕ і політична оцінка того, що робить Росія на території України. В міжнародному ядерному законодавстві є чітке визначення – ядерний тероризм. Це те, що сьогодні здійснює Росія в Україні. Жоден посадовець МАГАТЕ не назвав ці дії Росії ядерним тероризмом і більше того – не закликав світову спільноту, спільноту до протидії ядерному тероризму України. Це загрожує тим, що надалі тероризм не буде захоплювати літаки, а буде захоплювати атомні станції і ставити політичні вимоги до всього демократичного світу. Отже, висновок мій. Бездіяльність МАГАТЕ, яку вона проявляє, і відсутність фаховості у заявах МАГАТЕ – вони тільки сприяють тому, що рано чи пізно або цей орган потрібно буде докорінно змінити і зробити його нарешті дієвим механізмом як контролю за розповсюдженням ядерної зброї, так і захистом ядерних енергетичних об'єктів від будь-якої агресії у світі. Або ж цей орган треба визнати, що він не виконує своїх функцій і він як такий не потрібен людству. And now, uh, Mr. Ihar Burakovsky takes us on a somewhat more optimistic route, exploring the calmer, peaceful times that are indefinitely to come uh, and the benefits that Ukraine and the European Union will mutually receive with Ukrainian-European integration. Every country in its history has to make tough strategic choices, choices at civilizational level. This type of choice means clear and straightforward answer to the question, who the nation wants to become by and large? The choice is not limited to the political declaration only, though the statement of intentions is very important. But only actions can prove determination to move forward to the goal. In 1991, Ukraine did such a choice. We became independent and started our journey towards democracy and market economy. Despite all the problems, mistakes and backtracking, Ukraine has already laid down the foundations for democratic and market system and has been persistently working on further development of democratic and market institutions. We did our second civilizational choice in 1998. This year, Ukraine declared its intention to become associate member of the European Union. Later, in 2019, strategic course of the state on acquiring full-fledged membership of Ukraine in the European Union and in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was enshrined in the new Ukrainian constitution. The Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity proved that Ukrainian people are capable to fight for their choice. Now we are fighting for our European future and defend democratic world and Europe from Russia, endangering the very principles of modern civilization. Why we want to join European Union? We need to ensure a just and green transition. We expect that European Union membership will help us to make this fundamental change in the very way the economy functions. At the same time, We, as a part of European Union team, will contribute to promoting transition to green economy globally. Together we will save the planet for the future generations. We need better security. We know what war means and how to defend our sovereignty and territorial integrity. Therefore, we are critically interested in benefiting from common security and defense policy and contribute to its development as we know what war is and how to defend our motherland. We want to restore our country after the war. To this goal, we will capitalize on various opportunities arising from the European Union membership. We see Ukraine's reconstruction as an unprecedented pan-European investment project boosting European Union internal solidarity. This project will demonstrate the political and economic strengths of the European unity, showing how efficiently European Union can work. We want to further develop and strengthen democratic, social and economic institutions. EU membership will dramatically boost this process and make reforms irreversible. We view European Union as a virtually inexhaustible pool of know-how and best practices for managing, developing and regulating social-oriented market economy. 
European Union membership can bring home to Ukraine policy instruments and practices already working in the Union. Ukraine is critically interested in adoption of European Union antitrust instruments and practices, stock, bond and commodity regulations, safety standards, and European Union membership will definitely facilitate this process. At the same time, we want together with our European partners to develop and implement new rules, norms and regulations necessary to ensure the inclusive political, social and economic long-term growth. We want to strengthen our positions in the world economy. As a European Union member, we will capitalize on common trade policy to expand our export opportunities and to secure import of goods and services necessary for our economic development. As a part of European Union team, we will quickly and properly react to the global economic challenges. We shall cooperate with other nations to eliminate existing and new trade barriers hampering economic interaction. We want to further strengthen our scientific and research potential. We do understand that today's economy is the economy of knowledge. Therefore, we see European Union membership as a tool to deeply integrate Ukraine into European research and development infrastructure. This integration will provide us with unique educational, technical and financial opportunities. But at the same time, we have what to propose to European Union in order to boost its own research and development capacities. Even before the Russian aggression, our infrastructure required large-scale modernization, and we started this process. We want not only to rebuild infrastructure heavily damaged by war. We want to use European Union membership financial and technical opportunities to build in Ukraine infrastructure of the future. We see European Union membership as a tool to increase access by Ukrainian institutions and companies to the European capital and financial markets. This access is of critical importance for successful economic growth. And finally, historically, Ukraine has been an indispensable part of Europe. And as economists, I am more than 100% sure that European Union membership will boost economic development of Ukraine and strengthen European Union economic potential as well. Insights from the local level are also very important, and so we are very happy to introduce Mr. Vitali Zahaini, who talks about how international cooperation can be improved at the regional level and challenges that the regions of Western Ukraine are now facing due to the influx of refugees. Ну, в першу чергу хочеться відмітити про те, що ми маємо достатньо добру, класну підтримку з боку ряду міжнародних організацій в різних сферах. І тут насамперед хотів би мені зупинитися на окремих темах, які можуть бути предметом взаємодії між органами влади в Україні сьогодні в умовах війни та міжнародними організаціями, які готові мені допомагати. Ну, насамперед, ми це ситуація пов'язана з внутрішньо переміщеними особами. Це ті десятки сотні тисяч людей, які сьогодні ми лишилися без житла, які сьогодні тимчасово є фактично при... отримали тимчасовий прихисток в ряді західноукраїнських областей. Ми точно так само зараз маємо одну з головних проблем це перетин кордону зі сторони України. Це той випадок, коли е-м, хвилоподібно відбувається він швидке, дуже стрімке, я б сказав, нарощування кількості людей, які він має намір одночасно перетинати кордон. В сьогоднішніх погодних умовах ця ситуація ну, призводить до величезної кількості незручностей. І тому, власне, якраз облаштування тих митних переходів, які станом на сьогодні вже функціонують в області, їх є шість, два, що можуть бути мін додатково розгорнуті, це те, що теж є предметом для окремої взаємодії з міжнародними організаціями. Продовольча безпека – і в тому числі, як складова цієї безпеки посівна кампанія, це окремий предмет для такого, для такого співробітництва. І тут ми готові до ряду позицій, до обговорення ряду позицій щодо вирішення цих питань. Ми розуміємо, що знову ж таки в умовах затяжного конфлікту ми мусимо ми сьогодні переглянути і вже переглядаємо об'єми посівних площ, ми вже переглядаємо мен, позиції, пов'язані з тими культурами, які мен, мають бути висіяні. В першу чергу, ми скажемо, на користь мен, не технічних культур, а власне там це мова йде про зернові культури, про 
овочеві культури, про власне ті, ті речі, які в військовому порядку не мають в майбутньому гарантувати на продуктову безпеку. Налагоджені роботи бізнесу в нових умовах, в умовах війни, це теж один з окремих предметів. І, власне, тут ми розраховуємо теж на підтримку міжнародних організацій. Бо ситуація є такою, що ми отримуємо зараз ми в межах там, Львівської області і ряду інших областей Західної України велику кількість людей з числа внутрішньо переміщених, які, в принципі, приїхали, не залишивши свої підприємницькі справи в окупованих територіях. Це люди з відповідним бізнес-підходом, з бізнес-мисленням, які, в принципі, ми зацікавлені в тому, щоб вони могли розгортати тут свої, свої, свої нові підприємницькі активності. І крім того, є ще та частина людей, яка готова просто долучатися, тому для нас сьогодні мені важливо максимальне сприяння і допомога підприємствам, які переїжджають сьогодні, евакуюються з півдня Сходу України на територію нашої області з тим, щоб якомога швидше допомогти їм розгорнутися, розгорнути своє виробництво тут в межах відносно безпечних регіонів. Частково торкнувся вже питання трудової міграції, Бо це, власне, якраз теж є це супутнє питання, яке потребує участі і допомоги з боку міжнародних фондів. Взагалом ця співпраця зараз налагоджується, ця співпраця сьогодні не знаходить нові вирази, нові форми прояву. І поруч тим ну, можна говорити про те, що ми, в принципі, є задоволені з того, як відбувається ця співпраця. Але поруч хочу відмітити, що серед таких речей, які заважають якісному налагодженню такої взаємодії, є певна непластичність, неповороткість фондів. Це той момент, коли процедури, формальні процедури є настільки складними і настільки довготривалими, що від моменту там, оголошення певної проблеми, підключення, залучення фонду до вирішення проблеми, не проходить настільки багато часу, що потім вже ця проблема просто втрачає свою актуальність. І ми маємо просто бути готові, бо насправді ряд питань вони виникають настільки близьковично і настільки хвилеподібно, що їх дуже важко а спрогнозувати, а потім відповідно їхнє рішення воно має е, дуже короткий час для, для реалізації. Хотів би завершити розпочати мою попередню думку щодо певних недоліків у взаємодії у співпраці з міжнародними фондами. І їх в першу чергу відмітити той факт, що сьогодні нам необхідна не дуже чітка координація по визначенню пріоритетів в діяльності фондів. І надзвичайно важливо, коли ці пріоритети узгоджені з місцевими органами державної влади та центральними органами державної влади в Україні. Адже ті пріоритети, які були сформовані і передбачені стратегіями діяльності фонду, фондів в Україні в довоєнний період, зараз залишаються неактуальними. Тому надзвичайно важливим є якраз узгодженням нових пріоритетів, нових предметів та форм діяльності в умовах військової агресії. We close today's discussion with the esteemed speaker Andreas Umland, who happened to be one of my professors at the university ages ago in the peaceful times. He delves into three key issues that demand change of perspective uh, and subsequently change in action from our Western partners to contain the war, from uprooting the world security as a whole. I want to talk a little bit for the reasons why international organizations of the West and uh, also national states in the West have so far provided uh, insufficient help for uh, Ukraine. What is the sort of conceptual, the interpretative reason for this? And I think the main reason for this is so far at least, and hopefully this will change in the soon f- future, is that the help that Ukraine has so far received from Uh, Western international organizations and also from national states, uh, member states of the European Union and NATO, is that it's guided by what I would call the solidarity paradigm. So the major motivation for Western help for Ukraine has so far been um, the empathy, sympathy, the respect for Ukraine, um, the support, the emotional support that Ukraine has been receiving also the popular demand for um, uh, support of Ukraine in many Western countries today, uh, where the populations are clearly on the side of Ukraine. They want to help Ukraine in its defense. They see the suffering, they see the problems, and they uh, therefore urge their governments to help. 
Well, this is by itself certainly only to be welcomed. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it only goes so far and that we will we have, at least in Germany, where I'm currently located, um, a juxtaposition, uh, a confrontation, if you like, between um, the solidarity paradigm on the one hand that is guiding Western help for Ukraine and on the other hand, um, a national security uh, paradigm that is limiting uh, Western help for Ukraine and a sort of balancing of the urges of uh, solidarity on the one hand and security um, on the other hand. And by security, uh, what I mean here is the national security and perhaps even the individual security of citizens of um, the NATO and EU member countries who have um, their own interests in their own security, and uh, which is quite understandable, and is something that uh, limits, however, their, in general, high solidarity with Russia and the engagement of governments, um, of parliaments, of ministries, and also of international organizations um, in which the Western countries are members. Countries like Germany and other West, Western countries and the international organizations in which they are members should have a, a more, um, if you like, egotistic interest in an end of the war, in um, uh, negotiations and uh, containment and deterrence of Russia in order to protect its own um, interest, its own health, uh, the, the health of their own citizens uh, and uh, the basic uh, security interests of not only Ukraine, but also of Western countries. A second issue that is also coming more and more to the forefront uh, uh, is the issue of um, refugees. So far, um, the refugees have been, uh, numbers have not been that large and the humanitarian support for them has been encouraging in many European countries, above all in Poland, but also in other countries, there's lots of support for the refugees. However, uh, one wonders what happens when the 7th, 8th, uh, 9th, or 10th, or 11th, or 12th million of refugees um, um, arrive in the European Union and when it will become even for as large an organization as the European Union. Um, uh, difficult to handle, actually, these uh, large numbers of refugees. This is also something that should uh, redirect Western policies um, and the policies of Western organizations towards um, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. And the final, and I think uh, in, in, the, in a way most important aspect of the entire conflict of, uh, uh, of Russia versus Ukraine for um, Humankind um, is the subversion of the logic of the non-proliferation regime, the nuclear non-proliferation regime um, that exists since 1970. Countries around the world will reassess their security needs in the future. Many politicians, diplomats, experts will uh, look at what happened to Ukraine in the last eight years. They will look at Russia's behavior during the last eight years. They will also note uh, the restrained Western behavior. Um, towards Russia in the last eight years. We have now sanctions in place, but we still have no military support, direct military support for, for Ukraine. We still have uh, uh, no full sanctions imposed by, by the European Union on Russia. Uh, the already mentioned uh, large en energy imports from Russia into the European Union are still continuing so far. And uh, many countries and politicians and, and governments will learn from this experience and uh, what can be expected if the West continues be to behave like it is currently behaving, uh, if especially the European Union and countries like Germany continue to behave um, in the way they currently believe, what can be expected is that governments around the world will uh, consider whether it wouldn't be better um, to leave the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and um, instead get uh, nuclear weapons to uh, secure their own territories, uh, to be not as stupid uh, as the Ukrainians, and perhaps even uh, to snatch other territories of other countries that do not have nuclear weapons and to be as smart as Russia has seemingly been during the eight years. So the punishment of Russia, the help for Ukraine, um, um, a stronger punishment of Russia, a stronger help for Ukraine would support the um, uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime. And I think these uh, three themes, um, uh, the uh, security of the uh, Ukrainian nuclear power plants, the 
uh, the uh, refugees uh, uh, issue and also the uh, nuclear non-proliferation regimes uh, regime are topics that should be promoted by countries like Ukraine, by friends of Ukraine, in order to achieve a change of behavior in the West's uh, uh, policies towards Ukraine, towards Russia, namely uh, stronger sanctions by the West, more military support, perhaps not direct military support with NATO troops, but uh, delivery of more weapons, of heavier weapons to Ukraine, and uh, all sorts of other uh, support that Ukraine needs uh, uh, during perhaps the next weeks and months. You've listened to the episode of the special project by Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Euro Atlantic Course, and Analytical Center of Ukrainian Catholic University dedicated to the Russia Ukraine war, Ukraine in Flames. In order to stay tuned, please subscribe to our channel and share the word. In the description to this video, you can find the information how you personally can help Ukraine against Russian aggression. If you find our job useful, please like and share this video. And in the meantime, everything is going to be Ukraine.